My name is Carla Nesterin, and I'm a professor of pediatrics and internal medicine at the University of Iowa. My major function, if you will, in the academic world is actually uh, in the laboratory space, actually in complement disease. But it so happened that because uh, we have a primary presence with the uh, C3 glomerulopathy family support group, et cetera, we found ourselves in the space that needing to help families and patients actually make uh, get their access, if you will, to complement therapeutics. So I became a clinical trialist about, you know, four or five years ago, if you will. So um, I do uh, a bit of time in the laboratory. I, I am a um, practicing nephrologist also. So I practice in the children's hospital, but I also see patients in the outpatient setting, primarily C3 glomerulopathy patients. Those are, those are the bulk of the patients that I actually see. So C3 glomerulopathy and its, uh, I'll call sister disease, immune complex MPG, and are sometimes called immune complex uh, glomerulonephritis, uh, they're, they're both diseases of the complement system. And, and the complement system is a fairly complicated part of your innate immune system. But I think for the average layperson, what the important thing to know about that is, is that your innate immune system is what protects you from a day-to-day -day basis from infection. Uh, what happens in C3 glomerulopathy, for instance, is, is the complement system goes on because you need to fight an infection, but it stays on inappropriately. And in that, that process, you begin making uh, very many complement breakdown products. You consume your active complement proteins, et cetera. The kidney is, is somewhat of an innocent bystander in this, in that it receives all those complement breakdown products. It receives all the inflammation that results from a hyperactive complement system system, um, and then it gets damaged. And unfortunately, in the case of C3G, um, at least 50% of patients will go to end-stage kidney disease because of the activity of the C3G or immune complex GN or immune complex MPGN. And this is under current cares. So these are patients that regardless of everything we're trying to do for them right now, they progress to end stage. And it's even more frustrating or even more sad than that in that, um, you know, as nephrologists, we're quite comfortable. Okay, patients progress to end stage. We'll put a new kidney in. The problem is, is you put a new kidney in in this setting, these patients still have a very active complement system. So they unfortunately will destroy the new kidney also. So uh, unlike some of our other glomerular diseases or some of our other kidney diseases, not only do we have a good primary treatment, but even when we get to the point of needing a transplant, we're in, we're in a quite a frustrating circumstance. So uh, because something intrinsic about these patients makes them have too much complement activity and then the kidney gets damaged by this. It's a, it's a really a good question to say, you know, how would you manage a patient with C3G? Well, it turns out that there are a set of guidelines that we use. And, and basically what has happened is the academic centers have come together and created a set of guidelines that say that up to about 30% of patients will respond to a certain combination of medications. So if you follow the guidelines, you may be lucky and have a patient that gets some improvement. Now, it's not cure or it's not complete stabilization of their disease, but it's somewhat improved. And um, so there are a set of guidelines that most physicians can follow, but um, the, the the real point, again, is, is I've already sort of intimated, is that um, very many patients do not respond. And unfortunately, that set of drugs that patients that we try to use are exactly the ones that these transplant patients are on already. So when a transplant recurrence happens, we literally have nothing we can offer to them. So uh, it ends up being um, uh, it's sort of a vicious cycle. But but yes, there, there are a set of guidelines that we can attempt to use. But the the efficacy of the, that uh, what we would call standard of care is is pretty dismal still. And that statistic I gave you, you know, that 50 percent go to end stage and within 10 years of diagnosis is under standard of care. You know, so that and and unfortunately, you know, if you're 10 years old when you start your disease and, you know, you're, you're expecting end stage by 20 years old, that's obviously 
quite a heavy patient burden. I mean, I, of course, it's bad if you get your diagnosis when you're 45 also, but you can see that, you know, the, the, um, the sheer burden to the patient is very substantial when you, when you don't have a therapeutic that you can, you can um, hope for a, a better efficacy, frankly. C3G is, an, is a problem of the innate immune system, specifically the alternative pathway of complement. And um, the agent that was used in Valiant, um, it would have been predicted to be just the right type of agent because it targeted the alternative pathway, particularly the central protein in the pathway called C3. And this agent blocks C3 and C3B, a, a, you know, a sort of a partner protein, if you will, of C3. And it would have been predicted. So before we got these results, it would have been predicted to be a good idea, you know, a good shot that this, this actually could help this group of patients. The Valiant study, which I think is also an, uh, an amazing piece of this, uh, studied not only native kidney disease, but studied transplant patients, because I mentioned to you that the burden of transplant disease is significant here, um, but also studied adolescents. Um, what I, I didn't mention earlier was that this is a disease of young people. This is a disease that very frequently affects adolescents and young adults. So importantly, Valiant targeted that group of patients that was most in need, if you will. Um, and so it ends up being a, a placebo-controlled study, which is important for uh, to convince the scientists of the world or the regula regulators of the world that uh, if you bring patients in on standard of care in one arm and then on the agent in the other arm, can you predict a difference in the two? Or will, at the end of the study, will, will you see a difference in the two? Uh, which is obviously critically important because, again, these patients came in on the best we could do for them. Uh, and some of them got exposure to the agent and, and some of them stayed on, if you will, the standard of care. So that, that sort of structure of the Valiant study, and then you follow the patients over time. Uh, and then at the end of the time, then you get to the point where you can actually review the results, which uh, uh, we've seen some exciting, some exciting findings here. Perhaps a little bit uh, background is, is that we, when we think about the kidney, we often think about uh, high uh, loss of kidney function over time. But, and one of the things that often will predict loss of kidney function over time is just how bad the urine protein is, how high the level of urine protein is. And that's in the, you know, that adolescent group or in the, the adult group, it, that's irregardless of that. And so the, the, the most important finding here, um, well, one of the most important, because I'm a big fan of the, of, of obviously stabilizing kidney function, but one of the most important findings here was in fact the primary endpoint, uh, which demonstrated the statistically significant, um, and importantly for me as a clinician, clinically meaningful reduction in that urine protein, actually, frankly, to an amazing degree, 68% um, uh, reduction in urine protein from baseline in, in these patients. And um, that is absolutely not something that we see uh, under standard of care um, in C3G. There are other glomerular diseases. We might be lucky enough to see that finding, but never in this disease have, have I seen that in my career. Uh, and I do, um, you know, 90% of my patients or C3 glomerulopathy patients. So, um, so that's, that's the, you know, the primary endpoint, and that's the, uh, an incredibly important finding, 68% reduction in urine protein over baseline. But um, I can add to that because, uh, you know, as a clinician, I'm not just interested, can I reduce the urine protein? I'm interested to know, does that actually affect the kidney and, and kidney health, for instance? And uh, I translate this, you know, not necessarily a sponsor does, but I translate this to being, you know, how is the glomerular filtration doing? How is the actual function of the kidney doing? And in fact, Valiant actually met their secondary endpoints, which included the glomerular filtration rate. Um, specifically, I mentioned to you that these patients often over time lose kidney function. And in fact, secondary endpoint for this study was is that they had a st statistically significant stabilization, if you will, of the kidney function. And we use the term GFR, glomerular filtration rate, but GFR was stable in this group of patients who were treated with the agent, not so much in the placebo group. So again, we're getting that good comparison that's going to be required to convince the scientists and the regulators of the world that um, this agent did exactly what we predicted it could do.
Well, I think um, the, the great news, is, as I mentioned, even the original study design said that they already have reached the native kidney patient, the transplant patient, the adolescent, et cetera. Um, I think next for, for this um, study is, is that they approach the FDA and regulators, so also the European regulators, to actually get approval. I think that, uh, that that's going to be a critical step for all of us so that we can actually then begin using this agent in those in the patients to, who were not so lucky to have uh, been enrolled in a clinical trial in this in this setting. Um, you know, and, and then the longer term issue is, is uh, you know, of course, as a clinician, I hope that uh, approval is forthcoming and I hope the ability to use it in patients and even, frankly, get down to younger ages. I mentioned this, you know, their, their study was uh, 12 years old and up you know, eventually maybe we'll get to a younger age. That's, that's me as a clinician saying that, not as a, uh, as a uh, you know, a sponsor person, if you will, but um, it, it's got to be FDA approval for us, I think. I, as a clinician, am, am moderately frustrated in what I can do with these patients. And I have patients right in front of me that are progressing towards end stage. And I think this is a first, you, you know, if, we, if we're able to, to see FDA approval for an agent such as this, that's a huge amount of hope for patients. Um, I think uh, they may not understand this sort of top line results necessarily, but they're going to understand the hope of being able to reduce their urine protein and, and reduce their um, uh, loss of GFR over time. So I, I think you hit it exactly. This is, uh, um, you know, an unmet need that uh, has the potential to soon not be unmet. So I think that that's really important.